terms of business expansion, you find yourself in a pressured situation where you can't supply the demand of what it is that you are initially servicing. For me, it started off by being in the gym. There were many women who wanted to train with me in various parts of the country and then also the world, um, which then initially meant I had to digitize what I was offering. And I started off with my ebooks. When I say ebooks, I'm talking about my diet plans. And then from there, my workout plans. So then I started creating an entire portfolio of digital products that would help women no matter what phase of their life they would be in, because there would be lots of problems that women would be faced with. They would reach out and would say, Listen here, I just found out I'm pregnant. What's next? And that way the brand grew organically. And obviously, if you're growing with a woman, you know, we're not. It's a long journey. There's a lot happening. You're preparing for different things. From varsity, you're quite. I think women underestimate how much movement they're actually doing. And when they start the professional journey, they become a lot less mobile. And things change very quickly and people often start telling themselves lies about them getting older when in actual fact they're just not moving. So I provided solutions for that. Making, for example, um, if you're running out of time, design a three minute workout. Do something more express. Do something that offers it possible to work out when it suits you and that's how I moved on to the fitness app then from the fitness app I mean from the gym from the ebooks to the eating plans to the fitness app now everything became digital and then to complement that we have women that have been training now for years or maybe women who are starting out to train they need certain supplementation that they trust what am I going to trust I'm not just going to take any product over the counter they don't want to walk into the store and be faced with um, a man selling them something that doesn't understand women's bodies. They want a woman to sell them something or to not sell them something, but to provide a solution other than a man telling them that this is what you need to take because men actually just don't understand women's bodies. And that's the truth. Um, and that was the way that the brand expanded. Um, my, my goal was always to reach as many women as possible. And that's why you will never find me quiet about my message because yes maybe 10 people know you but another hundred thousand that don't you know and you don't know that one little bit of information or beauty information or lifestyle information or fashion if that's going to get their attention how is the fitness not going to spin off from that you know some people say oh yeah but you like they'll they'll talk about fashion and they'll say oh yeah but you know fitness is your thing and I'm like fitness has always been my thing it's never not part of of the core of the business and of the brand and if fitness is my thing the common thread is what is important to the consumer the client um, in the gym, you're only as good as your last session that you gave a client. And the intention is always to make sure that the client is safe, they experience the best service, and they walk around, they walk away feeling better than they were before they encountered you, you know? And in that way, you are lifting people. So the message will spread and expansion in terms of what's next, your clients tell you what's next. And then one thing leads to another. I think the challenges that you're facing in introducing a new product is there will always be something like it already. I wasn't the first personal trainer. You're not the first coffee shop to ever open. You're not the first person to bake a cake and sell a cake. You know? And the challenges thereof is not the competition. It is focusing on what you are good at. What is your network? What is your true voice? What is the vision behind the product, the brand? And why are you why are you introducing this product to the market? Where do you feel that there is, I wouldn't say a gap, because yes, there are gaps, but there also aren't gaps. Um, nothing hasn't been done before. 
Um, the thing with Challenger, the, the, the challenges being would be that, and obviously everything takes time. And I think a lot of people think that success is overnight and you have to really be consistent. And it always comes down to fitness because you have to be consistent. Every single day you have to do the same thing. The biggest buying power are women. And if a woman needs something and wants something, if a woman needs something and wants something, she's going to go and get it. And in terms of pricing structure, I was the first that I know of locally to have digitized and sold a digital product, as well as move on to subscription-based fitness fees. And it was an exercise that I learned about the psyche as well of the consumer. If you're going to undercut your prices and if you, if the value of your item is XYZ, don't undercut yourself because what will happen is the service and the product that you're going to provide is going to become weaker. Um, the, client, the consumer doesn't value it as much as well. They feel like, I mean, if somebody said to me that lashes was 250 Rand, I would never book at that lash lady. I'm going to be concerned I'm going to walk away with a, a few um, infections and, you know, my eyelids glue together. I, and I'm not saying some suck your prices, but I'm just trying to put it into perspective on how the psyche works on both ends. If you're going to do favors for people, what service are you delivering? If you're going to pay for something that is free, actually, or if something is free, do you value it as much as if you had exchanged and ran up? No. So that's something to consider when you're pricing yourself. When I spoke locally, I meant I had to look globally at what, on, on what trainers were pricing the products and similar kinds of um, packages to what I was doing and then obviously apply to the South African market. I think back then it was a lot easier to do so than now because the market is a lot saturated so you always have to be competitive with your prices. You have to still add value on top of that and your service still has to be the best that there ever was because anybody can turn around and go and get what you're offering somewhere else. So you always have to be your best. There's no time to slack. Look, I mean, I've been lately, we've, we've even fired and refunded a few clients. And I think that no money is worth your peace. And if you're, at, if you're in a position where you can either replace a product, offer a discount on the next product, um, send a gift to say, you know, we apologize for the inconvenience. And then the last one is actually refund a client because what they, some people I feel, what they want to do is just fight. And um, you're going to find that in any service or product that you're going to sell, those are your options and you have to just keep on moving forward. I do think that things have become more tricky, trickier since social media. I feel that the consumer is a lot more clever than ever before. Back in the day when we sat at home and we watched Glow Mail, needed whatever it was that they were selling. Nowadays, we know that brands go to influencers all the time and that anybody does anything for free. So how do we know that you had a great experience? How do we know that if you had spent your money, would you have spent it on that dress? Would you have spent it on the product? Would you vouch for that service? And credibility is not easy to find. And if you do have a community of people that trust you, and also nowadays people trust big brands. So if you're going into Zara, you can expect a certain type of quality, but also not. You can also expect maybe to have ripped it not have been an original design. Uh, nowadays, if you go into a retailer by the name that starts with llama, rhymes with llama, you know that you can find a certain type of quality, but you can also find 
may be problematic designs because they tend to copy uh, local global designers literally um I, I feel credibility is a challenge in today's age i think that if you do have a platform that believes in you and a community if you have a platform that you can preach to a community that believes in you it comes with a big responsibility and some brands might not have that and they feel maybe you know if, if i launch with this who's gonna want it and i i think that the biggest thing there is to be so passionate about what it is that you're doing whether it's a service that you're providing or whether it's a product that you're selling you have you have to believe in it before anyone else can believe in it because who's going to believe in your product if you can't and you don't want to see through the dark days just because you see success doesn't mean that it was always flying high you know people don't know what i went through to get to where i am it was intense you know so you have to believe in it you have to never give up sometimes though some people do need to just give up <laughs> but if you truly believe in your in your product and your service and you really have a passion for it that becomes infectious and other people want to work with it other people want to be around that and you need to use the free platforms available to you to express that and share that story so in terms of strategies because of my fitness business i learned a lot of strategies that worked that kind of happened organically it wasn't something that i planned out for it to roll out that way but if you train 10 women eight of them are going to tell their friends non-stop every 10 out of 10 of them are going to end up going to work and everyone's going to ask them what have you been doing and that is a walking example of a service the same like if you have eyelashes done in your hair they want to know oh my god where did you have xyz where did you buy whatever it is that you're wearing or eating and in that way i applied those strategies to my next business as well you kind of want and hugh hefner was really excellent at this uh i use it it's, it's a really crass example but if you think of playboy bunnies everybody wants to be a playboy bunny in the 90s everybody wanted all of a sudden everybody wanted blonde hair and they wanted uh, augmented chests and they wanted to live in the playboy mansion and they wanted to be in this magazine and to this day i don't know why <laughs> but this is what these women wanted to do and i mean i watched the show once or twice and i didn't think anything negative of it i never wanted to be a playboy bunny but every single halloween up until this day it's everybody's favorite costume, a Playboy Bunny costume. And I think what he did there was he had these ambassadors for his brand. And all they wanted to do was please him. All they wanted to do was look like he wanted them to look. And they sold his brand without him himself having to sell his brand. You know, I mean, he died. How old is he? Like, he was an old fart. And nobody paid attention to him, but everybody, it was the hype around the Playboy Bunnies. It was their vibe, it was what they were doing. How many of them had actually had spin-offs from being a Playboy Bunny? And that was the first kind of big ambassadorship, in my opinion, program that I saw. Um, and you can really apply that to any kind of business model, I think. So there's a tip for free. <laughs> <laughs> it was just something I thought of and I thought, you know what, Playboy Bunny, they were always ambassadors for this pornography magazine. I mean, who would have thought? I mean, it was immoral. Yeah. Collaboration. It's collab, it's collab. Okay, so the thing about collab is I quite like the synergy that comes out of it. I feel that if you're trying to build or create a product, it's not necessarily a campaign. It could be a message that you want to say. Uh, it could be an outcome for all parties involved. I think it's very clear to always communicate what is expected, what a collab means, so that there's no blurred lines. It's very important. I know a lot of people just want to have meetings for the sake of having meetings, but you can also just clearly type out what expectations are you know i feel that the industry and all industries are very um they overlap and cape town and south africa are quite small 
So you want to make sure that you as a business and as a company and as a brand, you're conducting yourself in a way that is very professional because a lot of, just because a lot of people aren't, doesn't mean that you have to operate in that same way. And in terms of collabing, it's never a smooth road, ever. Especially if you are sharing profits, splitting profits, this one gets that, that one gets this. Um, there will always be two different types of ways that people run their businesses. And when two different businesses come together in terms of experience, practices, energy, etiquette, just knowledge is not always going to be the same. So you need to keep that in mind when collaborating. Uh, who are you going to collab with? I also feel that a more established brand collabing with a less established brand is not necessarily a bad thing. It means that you are introducing an entire different sphere or edge or note or taste to your brand. And that's okay. Um, I do think in terms of co co collabing with anyone and not only collaboration, but who you align yourself with is so important because what does that say about you? Birds of a feather flock together. And you have to choose carefully. You can't just one day be doing this. Then you're doing that. Then you're doing, you can't be hopping onto every single thing that's hot because what's hot now is not tomorrow. And a lot of, a lot of things are too trendy or too flash in the pan. There's nothing wrong with that, but where do you see yourself as a brand? Are you also just a trending brand? Are you also just riding a wave? Are you just seeing where it's going? Where do you position yourself and what is your vision of your brand? And you align yourself with those brands that are in the same alignment. And this is something that, for example, let's just take Nike. I've been in the fitness industry since I was 23. I'm 39 now. Not once has Nike reached out to me, you know? And that is something that is not... Um, it's not something that I feel bitter about or pity about or, you know. I think that if you're focused on what it is that you're doing, the people that you need will find you. And if they don't find you, that's fine because you're going to create your own hub, your environment, your community. Um, and then by the time they might reach out, it's too late because now you want to come and you want to tell me what I must wear, you know, kind of thing. So it's very important to have your vision and stick to your vision and not do things because you feel, oh, you know, if I do this, so-and-so is going to notice me and they're going to come forward and they're going to sponsor me or collab with me or pay me or because then you're doing things for the wrong reason and you're always going to be disappointed because you're expecting a certain outcome from something that wasn't supposed to be the outcome initially. That's just something to think about as a brand. When cash flow is low, I like to break it down low, break it down. <laughs> no, really, you know, um, my husband always says, you can tighten your belt. Actually, I think the last time I said it was two years ago because I never really paid attention. But um, you have to be flexible. You have to ride the wave. You have to understand. You have to read the room. And luckily, I do have a six, seven cents and I can read the room. And I, a lot of my market research and my focus groups as such is social media listening to the things that women say listening to the things that new that young families say big families old people young people single parents what is the conversation that is being had and what is ha happening within their households what's what what's happening in their minds and i find a lot of my info on twitter which is now called x facebook and a little bit on Instagram and then obviously with my friends and the stuff that I listen. I'm a very good listener. As much as I can talk a lot, I can listen and it's not... I already know what's up before anyone's going to tell me, is what I'm trying to say. So you have to be very aware of what's happening around you. I'm not saying you need to watch the news or anything, but it does help having a partner that watches the news and reads the news. 
um, you have to be flexible, you have to be adaptable, and you have to also say, what can you not afford right now? And I'm not shy to say that in my business, uh, speaking about budgets to certain suppliers, to certain service providers, look, we need to discuss the budget up front because I cannot. What can we do? Um, I think that a lot of people, if you're going through it, that they're also going through it, and people would rather have the job and have the business and have the contract than not have it. And you cannot operate a business if you can't talk about money and finances and budget and talk about payment. Ask for payment, please. It's a cutthroat, it's a shark tail. Um, and there will be blood and it will be your own blood. So the best thing to do is be upfront about, look, this is what I can afford right now. Can we, you know, place less orders, you know, put certain projects on hold, see where you can, what can you do without? And those things make a big difference. And I'm telling you, in terms of service providers, back in the like few years ago, before COVID, actually, that's what it is, before COVID, um, I would easily take accept quotes. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine for this and that's fine for that. And I would pay supplies because I could. And you know what? A business can only thrive if you're thriving together. Uh, it's not about being stingy. It's not about saying, no, sorry, they need, to, they need to give me a better price. If I can pay that price and I feel that the work is worth that price, then you pay that price because you're going to create better work together. But if you are at a position, which I find maybe 2024, 2023, I don't know what 2025 holds, these conversations are conversations people are having within their own minds and in their own households and you need to have it within business as well. And that way you can also stay alive because otherwise there will be blood. I do think that there are different people that make the world go round and working for someone else or being in a corporate job doesn't necessarily mean that your journey is not as important as someone else's. I think that all journeys are important. I feel that you need to firstly love what you're doing because that's where you can spend most of your time is at work. Secondly, as a person of color, as a, as a woman of color, you have to work harder than anyone in the room. And things don't come as easily to you as it would for someone else. And this is a reality that I don't know if people are even mentioning it out loud, but it is what it is. I and mean, no one can tell me otherwise. I have friends that work in corporate, I have people that are in positions where it's not within their community based. And it is harder for women to achieve the roles that men achieve. Um, and unfortunately, you have to make a decision at some point. Um, do I want to be here where I'm, being, I'm getting capped? Or do I want to leave and start my own thing and bring on board people that I feel are going to create something magical? Um, and I have this conversation often with my friends who are in corporate. Why don't you just leave and do your own thing because you're better than me, you know? And a lot of them don't want to. So then you, you kind of have to make decisions. What are you willing to accept and where your strengths going to be? Um, nobody likes somebody who is conniving in the workplace. And I mean, the drama and the politics and Sometimes you have to say to yourself, is this a toxic work environment or is this just how it is? And there are other options, there are other opportunities. I do feel that if you are going to make a switch, that saving up is important. It was something that I had to even do within my own business, make sure that I had enough money to save up, to invest in certain parts of the next phase of my business. Before I, I you know, I left my gym for example or the other space but when i did that i didn't have anything that was another story um the point is you need to have a clear vision of what you can tolerate what you're willing to sacrifice and how far you can go in that position that you're in um and who is going to be who is going to be prioritized over you because I think a lot of people my age in corporate are in that position, you know? And what are you gonna do? Are you just gonna 
like get a position where you're working half day and then focus on your family life and kind of just go about it or are you going to become a stay-at-home mom but then what about your passion you know what about your identity you can't just be a mother so many women are all of above and when they say that you can't have it all the line because you can you know why can men have it all and we can't um in terms of entrepreneurship i think that you definitely shouldn't take out debt that for me is my biggest thing my biggest thing is to save up money and then to work slowly what can you afford this month what can you afford next month and build up like that yeah and and another thing for me was i was hell bent on not doing was a retail space because i do have an e-commerce site everything that you have that you see that i have you can walk into a store and purchase if i had to have a store but it is i decided no we are moving in a digital world everything i mean i love online shopping i can order something from quebec something's on its way from the states now some skins <laughs> not that i need it but i just like see the clothing so i thought this the skin might be nice um japan you can get anything from all over the world and people need to get with it 